Well, uh, I've uh, produced a kind of game art, it's just, uh, it's more of a picture except for the actual stats in it. Well, if we look at the uh, present crisis, it's quite evident it's quite different from the uh, crises at least before 2000. Bourgeois economists tend to simply <clears throat> look at the last 200 years and then compare uh, one with the other, assuming that they're basically all, all the same, or the causation is all the same, and therefore decide that <laughs> if uh, uh, the period from um, one point of the crisis to another takes so long, it will, at one time, and this tends to happen over a number of the, of the periods, that is what will happen now. That is most unlikely. Basically what I'm saying is the present crisis is, as many people have said, very similar, and I'd say causation very similar to what happened in, in the Great Depression, and that in turn can be compared to the long downturn at the end of the 19th century. Engels, if you remember, said the crises are getting more severe. In principle, that is correct, it appears to me. It only didn't look correct because in the period after the war, we didn't have crises in the, in the, in the same way. So insofar as, as what is now occurring is very different from the previous period from 45, or 40, if you want, down to 2000, it obviously is different. Now, at an empirical level, that's absolutely obvious because the spectacular crash has no precedent in, in the, the post-war period. But it, it is very similar to what happened after 1929. And as various people have pointed out, it is tracking the Great Depression in Britain. It's not tracking it in the United States, but it is tracking the, the Great Depression in, in, uh, in Britain. So that, that, that is the basic feature of it. The first point about it which may, has made it so different is the spectacular crash of finance capital. Now, again, one would expect it because this is the period of finance capital. In that sense, it isn't different because in the last 20, 30 years, we've been living under finance capital. But nonetheless, as a crash, the spectacular crash, it is, of course, different. So what, <coughs> the point then is to begin with finance capital. And in the handout I've referred to the, stati the statistics which I referred to last time, the incredible figure of $14.5 trillion being held in money for by private banks in the world, which uh, very largely means uh, the West. We only got that figure uh, a month or two ago. It was about fourteen and a half trillion dollars last year, and it had gone down as a lot of crash by about thirty percent. So we're talking about something like eighteen trillion dollars. Now you realise what eighteen trillion dollars means, obviously, <laughs> since we, we've all heard a trillion dollars or so. But it's uh, eighteen trillion dollars, uh, and of course this is an income as well. So one really should compare it to wealth. If you do, you'll see that the UK, according to the Guardian, uh, on the 4th of August, was worth seven trillion. So it could easily be bought up by uh, a section of the capitalist class, as it were. Well, the point is the relationship that it, it really is an enormous sum. And of course, 18 trillion is four trillion more than the US GDP, and uh, it's more than a quarter of world, world GDP. So, you have an enormous section of capital being held in money. I made this point yesterday. The fact that it's being held in money in this form is itself an indication. It's an indication of two things. One is the way in which finance capital has come into being and dominated. The second thing is, the second point, is the phenomenon of surplus capital. Let's <coughs> say the concept of surplus surplus capital actually coming into being in this gigantic form. By surplus capital, I mean capital which cannot be invested at a rate of return acceptable to the capitalist class, which therefore is not productively invested and is therefore held in the form of money <clears throat> rather than in terms of productive assets. 
Now, <clears throat> it's fairly obvious that if you hold this high level of money, it's going to have a skewing effect on the whole system. Obviously, what you're doing is withdrawing money from the, from the world economy. It obviously follows from that that you're going to have a relatively low rate of growth in productive assets. That has been the case, in fact, since they switched to finance capital. There was a very short period between 1995 and 2000 when uh, commentators and, and various uh, people were crowing about a new paradigm. Growth was get, getting ever higher and would go even higher. And innovation was fantastic and capitalism had reached this new, wonderful, self perpetuating paradigm. Obviously, once it crashed in March 2000, the, the paradigm ended too. Uh, it's now, of course, been recalculated, the rate of growth. Uh, one of the obvious points that could have been made, uh, has now been made, is that if you start to look at the increase in income, in terms of finance capital itself, it would make sense to uh, <clears throat> cut it down somewhat, since it's proved to be such a mess and the return has been so much lower, if you want to look at it in these terms. So in other words, the calculation has been redone and we're no longer talking about this period of greater growth. It's not clear there was great greater growth. Obviously in Marx's terms, it didn't exist anyway. So in fact, in the, uh, in the whole period, from the switch to finance capital from seven, something, 789 or 75, whenever you want to date it, down to the present, the rate of growth has been a lot less than it has been and it had been in, uh, in the West in the period after the war. Now, that was a deliberate decision to switch to finance capital. You'd expect that if you do go to finance capital, that would happen and that has happened. Uh, I'll go back to what that actually means and what they, why they actually did that. The point of um, getting to is, is why on earth you have this uh, 14 and a half trillion dollars being held in, uh, in banks rather than being invested. Well, <clears throat> clearly, if you're shifting out of productive assets, you have to invest and you have to put it somewhere. And in this period, as the, as the shift continued, the opportunity to put it into productive assets declined. On the, on the other hand, given the shift in control, and given the control over the working class, which went with it, which come back to the, there was a clear shift in the di distribution of income. Now, I think we, we all know that. But the, the fact is that the relationship between profits and wages has never been so wide since, since the war, which was a point I made yesterday. Now, it's fairly obvious that under those circumstances, you're going to have huge sums which require to be invested. And if the productive sector is not being expanded, then there's a problem as to where to invest it. The result was, right from the beginning, that you, that you started to get a, a massive rise in asset prices. There wasn't an inflation in consumer goods prices, the exact reverse occurred, as, as we know, but there was a huge rise in asset prices. And it was all assets. Obviously, everybody knows of the rise in house prices, but it applied to everything else, which the capitalist class could put its money into, like uh, pictures, commercial property. Now, that was its logic. Of course, if one looks back at it, it, it simply looks decadent. You can't say anything else about it. The usual way of looking at it in the papers, or well, well, much on the left for that matter, has been to talk a lot of bubbles. But there, there, there is no bubble really involved. You've got an automatic process occurring in which asset prices simply have to go up under these circumstances. It's still there. It's all the finest capital is that were wiped out. Until this $14 trillion is dealt with, it's going to go somewhere, so you're going to go get, you're going to have this pressure for asset prices to go up because there's nowhere else that it can go. 
So in that sense, there is a permanent bubble, if you want. But it doesn't make very much sense to talk about bubble, really. 